Hey Sam, how you doing? I'm amazing. Good. Obviously, I'm amazing. Well, you're always you? amazing. Of course, you're amazing. Look, I'm sorry to disturb you. What are we? We're four days, five days away from doing the show on yeah. Sunday. Yeah, it's eating up all my time at the moment. So yes. thanks for that. As it always does. But um, I've got a little special treat for you, a little surprise. Um, okay. Yeah. As it's the last show, I thought we'd have a bit of a, a big event. And I thought we'd interview probably the best joy builders in the world. Way! It's another selfie. Well, we've already kind of done that with the Giles and Oliver thing. So no, mate, no, mate, far better than that. Let's get them in. Join in now, ladies and gentlemen. Here they come, Matt Denton and Josh Lee. Way! How are you doing? Josh, he's got, here, here he is. is. Here he is. Hey. <laughs> How you going, guys? Oh, yeah, good, here. good to see you. Good to see you. So this is the last ever live show that we're doing. So, you know, we, we usually have interviews during the live show, which runs about five, six hours. And, you know, as it's the very last show, who better to get in at last than you two guys? Well, I don't know. I could think of a few, but, uh, you know, if you run out of options. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. This is the only interview. So uh, we've saved yeah. the best till last, hopefully. <laughs> So, guys, just to start off with, really, how, how I always start, especially with people in the industry, how did you get into the industry? Where did it all start from you? for you? You know, was it something you always wanted to do? No, it wasn't. I didn't think about it until um, probably in my fourth year of an apprenticeship. So I left school um, and wanted to do electronics and software. Well, actually, electronics at the time. I was fascinated with the Night Rider light, and I wanted to know how it worked. And so I studied <laughs> electronics. Yeah, and I and I did build one, and I put it on my Suzuki Jeep SJ410, which is really sad, but it worked. <laughs> um, Matt, you, oh, you... I was going to get one for my van. Oh I God! Yeah. Idea. No. <laughs> At least why, I can't... why can't we get you to do any LEDs now? That's why. Ah, well, that's <laughs> Josh. The reason. Do you know what? I did it with bulbs so I could have them fade nicely, like the Night Rider one. You know, so it wasn't just one of these chunky, like, you know, it was like really sweeping, beautiful. Anyway, it's another story. Uh, so I got into electronics. I did a four year apprenticeship scheme in electronics and computer bio software. And, and uh, I think actually halfway through my course, I switched to uh, software and electronics. And then um, I got a book on industrial light and magic and it, I think it was their 10 years of industrial and ILM something like big book big sort of coffee table book I was reading through that and realized they used technicians and I'd always loved Star Wars and you know sci-fi in general and Labyrinth was particularly an eye-opener for me as well for animatronics and um, I started writing to companies thinking that you could get a job like with the BBC effects department or ITV's effects department there is no such thing well there wasn't by the time I started applying I wrote loads of letters and got loads of rejections. Then I blagged my way to a television show, a production show in Earl's Court. Met a few people there and they went away. They said, come back with a portfolio. We want to see what you can make. We're not interested in qualifications. So I went off and I started scratch building stuff and I was, I was model making basically. I was, I'd scratch built a little a scout walker, about uh, so big, uh, a balsa wooden plazzy card. And the next year, and I made some other props, like little detonators and stuff and little gadgets for people to play with. Went back the next year and um, got a got a Saturday job, effectively. And then that turned into a summer job with a special effects company called Vendetta Special Effects. And never went back to university. I'd left my apprenticeship in God's University and then left after a year. And, and that, that was the start. Of wow. Entrance. Yeah, there you go. Nice. A very quick version of it. Nice. And what, what about you, Josh? Yes, um, so I think I always wanted to do it. Um, I had the Return of the Jedi uh, making of book, and then there was a there was a dark crystal exhibition where there were the props and the um, creatures from Dark Crystal, and that came to my local art gallery. And um, but I didn't have cine effects. I didn't know, you know, that you could do this. So went to art school. And um, was very lucky because I met um, there was a visiting lecturer uh, who turned out to be Jim Sands. No, uh, absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah. So oh, and rolling. so he, yeah, he we did. He didn't teach me, but we got on really well. And then he offered me a job when I graduated, and I was his kind of um, apprentice. That's not what he called it, but um, it was. Uh, <laughs> did you get, did you get on well through your love of beer? Yeah, there was, there was, yeah, there was. You know, the beers, beers were drunk, and um, so I. I yeah, left college straight into, you could get um, my first job, you could either have 50 quid a week cash in hand, and they gave you Tuesday mornings off to sign on, or you could have 100 quid a week, but you're on the books. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what did you go for, Josh? <laughs> I went for the 100, I loved it so much that I went for the 100 quid a week. Honestly. Good man, good yeah. man, brilliant, and, of course. And, and signed off. And um so uh, yes, yeah, so that's. Uh, but I did always want to do it. I did. Um, I didn't really know what it was. Yeah. Um, but I I knew that I wanted to somehow do what ILM. It was ILM. It was that ILM. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. This is it. I didn't know that you could do electronics or you know computers or that in film. I didn't know that existed. You know what I mean, it's, it's yeah. Just I not reading those books and like I'd never had Cinefix either. And it's like that was a whole world opened up when someone said, "Have you ever looked at a Cinefix?" I thought, "What?" Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you think? Do you think with the technology that's available today, three D printing and all that kind of stuff, what I know you guys are into, um, if it was now, do you think you'd have the same kind of impact that you had way back then, and the same kind of interest, or would that just be completely different now? It's it was a lot harder, um, you know, before CNC and you know Matt. Matt brought a CNC machine into Harry Potter and um, and it was just much more difficult. Um, the the motors weren't as good and um, there was no 3D printing. There wasn't the internet. So you couldn't yeah, of course. find anything. You couldn't find anything. You know? I remember, um, well, so I brought that CNC machine to Harry Potter in 2003 and I'm pretty sure when I started there, I was the only person with a laptop on their desk and I used to do a little bit of AutoCAD. And I used to cut the stuff on the CNC machine, and then Josh was looking at it, going, "Yeah, that's well, I like that." You just press a button, and it cuts it. You know, like. <laughs> and by the end of that year, I think everyone had a laptop on their desk. Certainly by the next year, you know, everyone was just sat in AutoCAD doing stuff. Um, and, and that's that's that was a game changer, like three D printing is now, wasn't it? I'd say. Yeah, yeah, it was. yeah. And there's there's certainly developments I've seen even on this production we're working on now. There's still progression and moving forward. And the way people are doing stuff now and the, you know, the, the production methods and the CAD design and the way we're knocking things out so quickly now, um, thanks is, to technology, is just amazing. The problem with 3D printing now is, is that it's so lovely and clean. Uh, and I've just been using my CNC router recently, you know, literally this week. And um, it's, it's amazing. I forget how good it is and how good it is at making things. Because I'm, I'm so used to printing nice, clean things. But... You forget about this old technology, which yes. is incredible, but it's so messy. And I hate the fact that I have to go and sweep up afterwards and clean it. And there's yeah. swarf and there's fluid and, you know, 3D yeah. printing is just lovely and clean. And it's just, yeah, it spoiled us, really, I think. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, we're all friends here, of course. And, you know, we I know you guys a little bit, so that's great. So obviously you're working on Andor at the moment. Matt and Josh, tell me everything you can about the new production. No, no, Sam. No, bit, bit Breaking early for up that, a mate. bit. I don't know. I didn't get any. Did you get bit, any of that? Just... Bit early for that. Bit early for that. Before <laughs> before we get on to Star Wars, even guys, you did mention about Potter, but you've done some cool stuff before Star Wars. You know what? What productions have you worked on? Maybe let's say what your favourite productions you've worked on to narrow it down a little bit. Matt, what what's um, what have you done? That he's still tuned Star out. Wars? So yeah, I was just waiting for the sound to finish. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I think, um, well, probably the the prior to pot. I mean, Josh has probably done what some more interesting things than me because I was I went off and did game shows for a while after I started in film. Then I went off and did game shows for it, and then came back to film. And when I came back, I came back onto Potter, so it got interesting from there on. I think prior to that, I did Lost in Space and Animal Farm and some Henson's productions. And it was, I wouldn't say they were the best films I've ever worked on. They weren't fantastic films, but it was a pleasure and a, an honour to work for Jim Henson's Creature Shop. So that was a 
you know, for me, it was like the, the pivotal point in my career, I thought, was getting to Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Yep. I think the heydays had gone by the time I got there. And then, uh, I, like I say, I went off into game shows and then I went back into Potter. And then it kind of, after Potter, things went downhill a bit in film world for us, animatronic-wise. We, we, it was a real boom time for a bit and then it all sort of disappeared. So for me, I'd say there's still the best things I've worked on is probably um, Force Awakens and from there on, you know, eight yeah. years ago. Yeah. It's sort of carried on going up, you know, and it's um, and, and that boom period is still seems to be going. I, uh, I always think I always think you're quite modest, Matt, when you mention game shows, and I always love to hear your stories and always brings to mind Millionaire. You worked yeah. on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Yeah, from the from the early days. Yeah, from very early days. Yeah, I I, did, I designed all of the uh, fastest fingers first keypads, those little modules that people sit there and press, and all the ask the audience technology. And um, I had a great job actually. I was sent around the world, uh, like doing the install. So we'd go out to America, and I'd install the whole system, and the, we ran the whole game show from one computer. And then I'd train up there the person who's going to operate, um, and I'd sit with them for two weeks. And what and it'll make sure everything ran smoothly. Um, and I was in New York when the very first millionaire was made, and he got to the tenth question without using the lifeline, and used the lifeline to phone his dad to tell him he was a millionaire. It was a unique moment. <laughs> how cool is that? That's yeah, how, very, and you know worth watching on YouTube actually. <laughs> it is a, it is a good one. I remember it. And but how cool is it? You know, some people take film for granted, but also all this stuff like game shows and technology. You just watch it and it just happens. But you know, there's your good self that set that system up and has been traveling the world and have had a cool gig from it you know the yeah. amount of people and the technology involved is is amazing it's it's brilliant and credit to you as well it's, it's superb josh what about you what um what have you done in the past Mem mem memorable jobs it's probably whenever you were involved with jimmy sands as well that <laughs> probably would be we met back to him but people won't know jimmy but he's a bit of a legend in the industry and um he just He's just adorable. Everybody loves him. I know Sam's met him, and um, he, he's a he's an absolute darling of the yeah. of the industry of the Creatures Workshop. But what what productions you worked on, Josh, that are memorable? Um, so my first big kind of big big film was um, The Fifth Element. Um, did Frankenstein before that, but the first like proper pine with the 007 stage, you know, that was The Fifth Element. Um, and um, in fact, I got um, I got. The memorable bit of that was being shouted at on the 007 stage by Luke Besson <laughs> um, in front of about 100 crew and 200 extras because uh, I'd, I'd um, they'd uh, they got a Bren gun so we'd made these um, aliens you know the, the Mangalores I think they're called and um, my one was operating the Bren gun and um, we had to wear face masks because, you know, and um, so we rehearsed it and I had to kind of make the face go, ah, you know, like that with my radio. And, um, uh, and then on the take, they actually operated the brain gun and it was so terrifyingly loud and awful. But I just froze. I, I just, and I didn't, I didn't do that. Uh, so reload, uh, reload the brain gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it cost, cost a fortune. And then and Luke Besson, who um, is, you know, uh, an auteur French director, and um, he, he, he unusually, he's the um, DOP as well. So he was sat on the dolly filming, looking right at the lens at what should have been happening. And, and then at the end of the take, after I just went, <laughs> he, uh, he, he turned to me in front of 300 people. He said, was it working? <laughs> was it even switched on? Oh my God, <laughs> no. Because I'd ruined the take. Uh, yeah, so that was a memorable moment. That was but, horrible. But Josh, you've uh, never done it again, have you? You didn't do it again? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't be good in a war. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no. I, I, uh, Matt's better at um, under pressure puppeteering. Um, actually, I, I do get nervous, and I, you know, um, Matt's very good at that. Very cool head. 
after I because I stopped caring years ago, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, to, like doing that, um, you know, the the red carpet BBA at Anaheim. That's that was yeah. that was that took think, some. Uh, yeah, it was the last time I was actually properly nervous. I honestly can say that was the last time I remember having nerves, proper nerves. You know, and and I seem to. I seem to remember, Matt, you get the adrenaline rush after the event, thankfully. So, you know, the, the nerves and your calm and all that, but then it hits then you after. Yeah, yeah. Like afterwards or like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 That's not that's not a bad way around to do it, really, to be fair. That's right. that's not bad. But to be um, honest, to be honestly, let's be fair, right? These guys are, you know, BB eight is a dual control machine. R2, most of the time, you're just moving your thumb left and right, right? Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, R2's like <laughs> that's what you're that's what you were fishing for isn't uh, it Sam? Like, like reminder Matt this is the droid building show we're doing here <laughs> the thing about the, the red carpet DVA is that there was um, the jeopardy of the uh, head falling off at any moment yeah. so um, um, R2's doesn't his head doesn't fall off if you no. get it wrong. no very, so, very true I remember when um, when we were getting ready for that Anaheim thing and Matt said, um, you know, because we knew that it was going to be massive because, I mean, it, it's it's kind of hard to remember now, but the buzz about that and, that, and the whole film, you know, because it was Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill and, you know, and um, and and we knew it was going to be live streamed and and then we were just like, oh, no, but what if it goes wrong? You know? Yeah. And Matt said, well, our humiliation will be global and immediate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Love that. Yeah, but yeah, at least, at least, Josh, you was... weren't the operator. So that wasn't yeah. Matt putting you under undue pressure then, was it? You know, I know I know, you still took a lot of Matt's pressure off of him, but uh, you still felt the pain. But uh, Well, jo jo the thing is, if the head had to come off, it was Josh's job to go on stage and put it back on. So he had the pressure that he, he might have to walk on at any moment and go, hello, in front of 6,000 audience and a million live yeah. streamed, or, you know. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember, because you did sort of rehearse for that, didn't you? I, I do remember that. We had a plan. Uh, we never rehearsed, yeah. we had a plan. I'm on I'm on topic, actually, just, yeah. just for the, um just for such a memorable day. I, I knew it was bound to come up in conversation, you know, and um, it, with, with BB-8, when you were originally told about the build and, you know, obviously it was a, a puppet at first and the trike and so on. And you had, you know, different um, builds for BB-8. How difficult did you think it was going to be? Did you feel it was going to be impossible? Or when, whenever you're given a build like that, you know, anything you're asked to build, do you ever think, I can't do that? Do you ever think that? Um, we, did, we did actually consider doing it like the red carpet one at the beginning. Um, but, and there was a few ways of doing it um, that sort of went through with, with Neil Scanlon, um, but it was, it wouldn't have been right for filming. So um, we sort of rejected those, which I think is where the idea of the red carpet one kind of came from. It was always wanted to revisit it. Um, but also Neil, uh, kind of he didn't it was all so secretive um and you weren't allowed to read the script and and i don't think he sort of kept it from me a bit i don't know whether he told matt but um um so it was it was and that was a good thing really because um it just meant you could concentrate on how to make it work rather than worry about how iconic it was going to be or how important to the story about, it how, yeah how much in the script it was wasn't it and the, and the amount of action it had to do and we didn't know any of that well very no we bit. just weren't told i mean it was so secretive it was um you know it's in incredible but when we started that the most complex thing we were building was the trike because we'd already ruled out a red carpet bb8 by that point and so the next most complex thing was the trike and so that was the complex challenge for the film when we started really wasn't it josh and then that's josh pulled me in to do trike simulations to see if that would even work in a in the before we built it in the real world we built it in a physics simulator 
so we could drive it around in a virtual world and you know so that and that was the first time we ever did that i think it's the first time we simulated an animatronic wasn't it josh and tried it before we built it and then the the visual effects producer um asked for the wiggler um, version like a standalone version but the one that sold it to um the director was the puppet version really so you know it's just sort of hands-on get lots of expression right and so yeah that, that it, but um just kind of evolved really and that and that whole thing became um uh, it, was, it was quite difficult to figure out that sort of system of different versions and um and you know have a puppet one for the close-up stuff where it really needs like the you know the movement was so subtle um that um dave and brian got with it um but that became a kind of standard form so dio had a puppet version and a trike version and a wiggler version semi-interchangeable parts which was uh, yeah. the, head, the heads yeah. were swappable weren't they stuff and and that of that decision obviously proved to be correct because after Force Awakens, you obviously had the red carpet BBA in your toolbox, if you like. So when you went on set, that was an option to use for Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, but it wasn't really used, was it? So your call to not be able, not be performing that on set was did prove to be the right call, really, didn't it? I think. Yeah. Did we do any? Did we do one did, shot? Yeah, we did. Like I think I did. I did one or two shots and really it was a really hard shot as well. It was one of the weird things. It's like, we're going to go from there to there and you won't be able to see it. You've got to go under a table. And it's like, why are we doing this with, a, with the red carpet? <laughs> and it was like the first shot, day one, I think. Wow. But then what we did do we on on um, episode eight, we did build the rebel droids and they were all red carpet ones. Yes, of course. Yeah, that's They're right. All trundling around in the background. And that yeah. was, I think, I think that was a cost thing, right? Just because it was like, if you build a red carpet one, it's a background shot. And it's, It'll do whatever it does, and there's no cleanup, and you know. Yeah, because they were sort of incidental, or more incidental to the shot. They didn't. The, the thing about the trikes of the puppet is that they're incredibly, you know, like you can come into yeah. shot and stop like that. Hit a mark. Yeah. You just can't do that with the red carpet. Mm. Lulled, yeah. Like that. So um, it was the right thing to do. Um, so it's horses for courses, you know. You you you. Um, you know, you make the you, you make it for filming, really, not for um, uh, just a standalone version. You have to think about what's needed on set. And this yeah. is a that's an in, that's a that is one of the problems when I worked at Henson's and we did Lost in Space. Um, they they unfortunately got into a bad habit by the time I was there in the late nineties of building something that did everything. So trying to make a red carpet of whatever you were making, let's say. And uh, the Lost in Space robot, we built two of them, but we built two of them which were fully operational. Every bit of it worked, you know, it had two sets of arms, it was fully hydraulic. It rolled along, along on these big tracked motors, as opposed to building five. And each one had like the upper segment would work on one for close-ups or, uh, you know, one of them would just have tracks, but be lightweight so you could drive it along. And, you know, this thing weighed a ton and a half, had to be forklifted everywhere. It was just completely the wrong way to to go about making something, but that's what excited people at Henson's a lot. They just build it for real. And it was the wrong thing to do and proven the wrong thing to do. So, was it yeah. was it probably the cheaper option as well, Matt, at the time, do you think? I don't think it was, to be honest. No. I'm, I'm not sure it was. Um, it got, it was a, yeah, there's a lot of money went into that. And I think um, cost Henson's a lot of money as well, that project. Yeah. So. The, the trouble with building like versions is that you have to build all those versions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah uh, that's, that's very very true right. with with the red carpet bba that obviously turned out to be very fortuitous to us because we yeah. got to travel the world and do some really cool gigs and i always remember mm -hmm. whenever i think of the, the events that went on especially the one you did was the chinese new year which i always think is a great story that you two had to attend now I think, wasn't that with the glitter ball? Was that the Chinese? Oh, it's the only time I ever crashed at BB-8. Well, I didn't crash I, I didn't. The only that, time, that, the only I, time I ever lost control. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks I, very much. It's the only time I ever made a mistake in a live performance. And uh, yes, it was, a, it was a glitter cannon. We'd, um, John, we had to, 
it was across a stage and to get to the, it was like every backstage was every version of Disney princesses and like there was things running around creatures and, and everyone had a little slot, like a 10 minute slot on stage. And but get, to get to stage, Josh would have to go one way around the auditorium and I have to go the other way. Josh would go with BB-8 to come in one side of the stage and I'd end up on the opposite side of the stage looking at BB-8 and Josh. So you'd lose communication as you go around. Our comms would drop out and you just hope that you'd both turn up. And then I had to come out of stage, go around a corner, do almost a 180 and go down a catwalk, which was about two metres wide. And so BB-8 is about you know, 50 yards across the stage and I'm looking at it straight on and we did the rehearsal. We had one, one rehearsal. It was so busy, we got one rehearsal. It came out, came around the corner, down the catwalk, came back in, around the corner, back out. And it's all pretty dark. You know, there's mood lighting. And rehearsal, beautiful. We got to the moment, so it's like full on, you know, lose communication, run around the battle. Oh, yeah, Josh is there. I can see him in the darkness. And then it's go. And he came out of the stage and just turned right around and went straight into the wall. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on? It was just spinning. It was like, I couldn't stop it spinning. It was just like it was on ice. And it was because previously a glitter cannon had gone off. And as he came on, it rolled around and the static just built up a layer of glitter on the ball. And then it was just like spinning and, you know, you couldn't control it. Wow. Yeah, so that was oh. fun. So thanks, thanks for reminding me of that failure. It was... <laughs> They haven't told us about the glitter can. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't in rehearsals. <laughs> no. um, they had one glitter can. And they used after, it, yeah. after, after that, we did always go to venues and go, are you going to be using the glitter cannon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so did I, Matt, after you, thankfully you told me. So uh, yeah, that, yeah. Was, <laughs> that was always a good question to ask. So, Matt and Josh, uh, you know, obviously I, I know you guys uh, from set and stuff when we did the uh, Rise of Skywalker and you do some incredible work and I was certainly blown away by Maz the animatronic is that you guys have built for Maz and I had the pleasure of um, well maybe it's pleasure of helping you guys once or twice lifting Maz across set which for me was pretty terrifying because I don't even know how much that thing costs or what the value is of that and going over a jungle set is pretty daunting to say the least but what it what it enabled me to kind of understand about you guys is that you are kind of the newfound heroes of animatronic this animatronic world and you know now you're doing signings you're getting the right kind of recognition certainly that's deserved and you know how how does that feel are you kind of getting recognized in the street hey you're that guy how does how does that kind of come about is it is it is it just the comic cons what what's the deal with that the only time i've ever been recognized is at a star wars convention <laughs> <laughs> and it was and it was and it's probably like someone that i once worked with or something you know i think one i think once ever someone shouted my name out who who i didn't know and the, but then they knew me from like the, the builders club or something do you know what i mean so no uh, it's like it, it's it's very nice to have recognition don't get me wrong but no i'm not being stopped in the street <laughs> well, i got i got recognition for you by mistake when i was at a christmas party one year and somehow a conversation of star wars came up and somebody else mentioned something about building r2s and this guy said oh i know matt denton and i went you know this is completely out of context i'm going right and you're always a little bit like, okay, yeah, I used to be the neighbour of his sister. And I'm going, and I, I don't know why, but I messaged you going, do you know this Holly. guy? And I think yeah, I got a photo of him. And you're yeah. like, not a clue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't know him. <laughs> did get a drink out of it though. So, you yeah. know, happy days. <laughs> well, my, my sister was doing a quiz during lockdown, a Zoom quiz with a group of families. And this guy had set the questions, and one of the questions was, um, uh, who made BB-8? And so my sister and my niece and nephew were like, oh, brilliant, you know, like, you know, Neil Scannon, and put the right answer down. And then when the answers came back, it was Sphero. No! Yeah, so had, they had Sphero down as the BB-8 creators, and my sister went, no, you're wrong. And they were like, no, no, actually, they're you're right. right, we're right, I'm, I'm an expert on Star Wars, and he went, so my sister launched into this massive fight as well. She's like, my brother made it. You cannot take, you know. So anyway, it's hilarious. They had this huge row about BB-8. Wow. It's crazy how passionate people are, though. And so I think certainly within the Star Wars fandom, 
you know, you must see that, that, you know, people wanting autographs from, you know, what would have been in the 70s, kind of, it's just a job, you move on, um, unless you were seen on screen, you know, this is quite a diverse kind of industry, I guess now, and the recognition for, you know, making and designing the BBA, it, you know, and I've seen inside that thing, and it is, you know, I, I did the, um, the, oh God, what was it called? The Last Jedi press junket with BB-8 and, and R2-D2. And I was on, I was in this little kind of hotel room. In fact, Lee, you were there as well. And I remember saying, turning to Lee and go, why on earth am I building an R2-D2? Because this is insane. <laughs> you know, th the technology is just mind blowing. And, um, you know, I was like, I felt almost like I was wasting my time, you know, because that is, you know, just insane, just in an incredible achievement um, to be to be able to have made something that, that functions in the way that it does. Red carpet on set, that whole kind of shenanigans that that is there. How does that feel? Is that do you, do you get the kind of do you get any sort of feelings from that? Or is it kind of well, that was just another job? No, the, I mean, it, this is. I mean, this is certainly the best job I've ever had. I mean, I, for one thing, I, I like Star Wars and I like the style and um, um, more than any other, you know, more than Marvel stuff or, or, or um, sort of fantasy stuff I, or Lord of the Rings or anything. I just like the style. So, um, it, and also it is, you know, the, the, as Matt has said before, you know, to get to do a kind of almost like a lead character um it was just like one it's like once in a lifetime stuff really and um so extraordinarily lucky um to do it and um and then to be kind of uh well you know the building the red carpet was a very conscious choice to try and get on the you know on the promotional tour and it worked you know they took us on this promotional tour and and then they started wheeling us out um to uh do interviews and things like that so i mean just nuts you know it's just it, it, to build just... yeah to build something that that the thing is it's like you're saying it was really technical technically challenging build it was but but it could have been terrible the character could have been terrible so the nice thing was that the yeah. character was good and people loved it because otherwise it would have just been another technical achievement but you know and i think that the character and and the technical achievement but the nice thing about that that the two went together and um josh and i won a, a an industry award for it which was you know i never expected to pick up a an industry award for off-camera work do you josh i mean it's that's you know that's crazy and and to turn up at that was the for me was the icing on the cake to get uh, industry recognition for a character you worked on um mm -hmm. You know, on top of all the fan recognition of loving the character, and and but I think and the, and the fan recognition is great because um, it, it, it feels like my people. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like you know, like you're you're sort of uh, you know, like always been. Um, you know, I'm not saying Star Wars fans and droid builders are geeks. <clears throat> yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, and so and so. Just, sort of, become like, I, for a while i felt like the prince of geeks you know and uh which is great why um, not and why not do you, do you uh are you are you are they camping out at your door still josh is that still happening can you yeah. walk can you walk down the street still <laughs> yeah <laughs> He's bought. He's been bought plenty of drinks. I know that for a fact. So as yeah. as we all have, to be fair. So uh, that's that's quite a nice benefit from it. So, I, I, sorry, go on. Go on, Matt. Sorry, no, go on. No, I was going to say there was a the, one of the nicest things I remember well, after the Anaheim gig and the red carpet gig, and people said, "Oh, they actually built it," because people couldn't believe we actually built. Or, or they thought it was CG, um, and there was all that massive. You know, explosion on the internet of how does BB-8 work, and there's all these different theories of cats inside of balls and all that stuff, and <laughs> people were coming up with draw hamsters. And but there was a the nicest article I ever read, and I wish I'd kept it. I probably got it somewhere. It was a really short paragraph, and it was someone who had contacted um, a technical university, I think it was in London maybe, and asked a professor of engineering how would it work, and he said, you know, there's a number of ways that you could achieve you know, having a head 
levitating on a ball or fixed to a ball. It's a number of different ways. It doesn't really matter because they pulled it off to perfection. And, it, and that was it. Ah, it was nice. A, it was a magic trick, and who cares how they did it? it right. It, they did it, you know, and that, that was the nicest thing I ever read of him. Nice. Really nice. Well, you know, there's. There, I've got a very short story with that. The night we went out in Chicago and we had a few drinks and stuff, I was sat next to your wife, Josh, and we were just talking. And obviously, Dio had just been brought out. And months before, when I'd seen Dio on set, I was I laughed because I was like, the droid builders are never going to be able to make one of these things. You know, that is mind blowing. And your wife was like, yeah, he's been working on it for weeks. And it's the 11th hour. And, you know, uh, it's that typical partner here he goes again kind of situation and i know your son was there as well and um what was quite memorable about you two guys um both of you are genuinely really top guys as well um josh you especially when you remembered something that i was like how do you know that and i'd mentioned it to someone and you were squirreling away in the background um and you retained that bit of information and i was really impressed that you kind of you know cared about that situation and, and spoke about it. And the same the same with you Matt at the um you know I was lucky enough to manage to sneak my way into the um after party thing at uh, in London and you introduced me to some people and you didn't need to do any of that kind of stuff and that was that was just really kind of humbling to go, you know, these guys are big names in this industry and yet they are, you know, spending a little bit of time there just to sort of talk to me about um, or introduce me to things or, or take a little bit of time just to recognize what you know what that's all about but Josh when we we're in when we were at Chicago and we we're at the bar and I met someone I'm not gonna mention any names but I met someone that um, had a, com- a few component parts that might have gone into a few of the robots and they were there at a different show and I knew this guy and he was on my LinkedIn and he mentioned a couple of things about you uh, whoever made that do droid needs to win a, Mo- a, N- a Nobel Peace Prize, <laughs> and uh, I was just like, "Oh, that's really cool!" And I turned around, <laughs> and you were there. He was here, and he was walking off. And I thought, "Well, I can't say anything about this person being here." And I came up to you and went, "Oh, this guy said this," and you were like, "I want to meet him," and he'd gone. So I was on LinkedIn, <laughs> going, "You've got to come back." And he he turned back up with his wife, and I was like, "It was like a." A meeting of the mind. There you go, guys. See you later. And off you went into the sunset. And it was a truly magical moment to go. This is really cool when you when you're able to put people together to have a conversation about something that they are enormously passionate about. So uh, it's always something that I remember that that particular moment. It was it was, it was very cute. How, how's that prize working out, uh, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> There's no bell being in contact. <laughs> Get a phone call from Sweden. Yeah, yeah. I've got to ask you guys. I've got to say, Josh, it's really nice to. What I find interesting about meeting all the droid builder guys is, um, is that they often come up with better ways of doing it. So, like you know, like you say that the the um, BB-8 was complicated when you looked inside, but it was overly complicated actually. Mm. Um, and and so it's really interesting because um you know like necessity being you know like we get big budgets and everything but um when you've got to pay for it yourself you, you have to come up with clever solutions and, and there's been some brilliant ones you know we also we also get a very short time and we only usually get one stab at it you know so. <laughs> and it's yeah and it's the first time that mm. anybody's done it so it is a bit difficult but um i do like all the um, the ways that people come up with all the solutions and clever tricks. And the the thing that gets me is how tidy they look inside. <laughs> look inside. <laughs> Some guy showed me inside a car, I think it was a guy called Chris, and kill me for not remembering his second name, I think it's Chris, quite a young chap in America, and he showed me the last time I went, and he opened up the inside of it, and it was just, the wire routing was just beautiful, and I was like, oh God, don't, don't look inside of ours. <laughs> you know, wow. I was I was going to ask you actually, guys. You know, when you're building your your droids and stuff, do you sometimes think, you know, the way you've decided to make BB-8 spin on the spot, or with Do the way he rolled and turned, the builders aren't going to suss this out. Or I wonder how long it will take for the builders to. Oh, oh yeah, no, I'll do it on purpose. Absolutely, do it on purpose. yeah, um, completely try and stitch everyone up. <laughs> I like it. Keep that one up, Josh. I love I love that. 
I think I think the thing that no one could believe on the first red carpet, and I think the reason why we did it the way we did it on the first red carpet, the second one we built was different, but um, because the first red carpet was a solid sphere skin, um, and it was like Josh build the ship in the bottle, which was a nightmare to put together and stuff. But the thing that we got working, which um, no one could believe the way we did it, was using lasers to project LEDs onto the outside surface. Yes. If you tell someone that, they're like, why would you lose, use lasers? And it's because the way it was built, there was we originally weren't going to put lights in it, were we? And it was a, like a late, I was like, well, if we projected lasers in like this weird pattern on the, which rotate with the axle. I mean, it's yeah, bonkers. That's amazing. And then, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's, the, that is. Oh, well, there you go. Wow. So the, the funny thing is, though, if you put your hand, because the, there was a blue laser in there, <laughs> which we had to defocus and then it refocused to get. So you sort of, it goes for a focal point and then spreads out again. But if you put your hand into the Mark 1 BB 8 and hit a blue laser, it burns the back of your hand. <laughs> the smelling of hair, all this burnt hair smell. <laughs> well, do you remember when, um, do you remember when we were. Um, we'd loaded it into the back of the van to go to the Heathrow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, where's my phone? Oh, where's my phone? I've got my passport. Where's my phone? And I'd, um, I'd, used, I'd been using the torch on my phone to try to check on the lasers or something. And I'd left my phone inside the <laughs> <laughs> I think that happened twice. I think that happened twice. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. ringing the phone and BB-8's ringing oh. amazing <laughs> just taking a quick step back the one of the projects that you guys worked on I believe the pair of you at the start was the Mantis robot is that right uh, yeah I started Mantis project uh, in 2009 and Josh worked with me on it for uh, nine ten months maybe more that what happened that. Josh did you get bored no, I ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't afford him. <laughs> couldn't afford him. Uh, uh, he, he was he was doing mates rates as well. Yeah, no, he gave me a very affordable rate, but I just literally ran out of money. It was a that uh, was not a cheap project. Although, to be honest, uh, if you try if you took that project to somewhere like Neil Scanlon or another effects type company, it would be. 10 times what I did it for. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it was done for a, a ridiculously small amount of money considering the scale of the project. Um, and without Josh giving me mates rates, there's no way it would have got done at all. So, you know. <laughs> and how long did it take, Matt? Uh, well, by the time I'd really finished it, the because I built a version in a year and a half and it had loads of problems. So it kind of all got stripped down and rebuilt. It was three not years. on the road for my fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, the the legs did kind of snap the first time it stood up. Oops. So um, yeah, okay. so three years later, three years it was total. Three yeah. years, wow! You should, have, you should have employed a proper engineer, man. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it did actually in the end. Didn't you? <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't afford them, Josh. <laughs> so guys, just going back to Star Wars, we've spoken about the droids, but you've done other stuff as well within the Star Wars universe. Have you got any other? non-droid related thing that you can think of that you've worked on that, you, that you've enjoyed my, you know what was funny uh, i saw last night um i was looking at uh, oculus quest or whatever they are you know the vr headsets which i don't have yet and i was looking at one for another project i'm working on um and uh, six eyes popped up he's in the game, oh, he's the six, game. of course and yeah. do you know what was funny? i had to go and watch it then i was like, i'm gonna watch this youtube clip and um, because six eyes i think is one of my i think my proudest animatronic control yep. system on it because it had all if you've seen the video on youtube it does all this sort of eye tracking stuff and the computer game version they've mimicked it beautifully wow I mean, it, really it's almost yeah the way it moved i was like oh my god they kind of almost reverse engineered my algorithm it's really really well done i mean Amazing. it's not quite as fluid all the time yep. but the, the times it does do stuff it's bang on it's unbelievable wow. i was like oh and that was a, quite a nice thing to know that someone had to try and copy how it moved from the film. Wow. So because, like, yeah. yeah, because Matt, you do program all the heads, don't you? The animatronic heads. So the, yeah. we get the mech shop and they make all these marvellous, you know, servo controlled heads and so on. But the final touch, it sort of goes through to you for the programming side of things, just to get everything moving fluidly, doesn't it? Yeah. And that, and that particular one was was a lovely project because it was built by Gustav, who was our head uh, animatronic engineer who does lovely mechs and it had about 60 servos in it, but I remember correctly, but um, it was one of those ones I'd been, I'd, I'd been developing 
animatronic control systems that used inertial measurement units so they could track the movement of a head. And that just, as soon as I saw that one, I was like, oh God, we're gonna have some fun with this because all the eyes could be slowly delayed so they kind of follow each other. And so it would look down and he'd look at the cards on his table and look up again, you know, all that. It was just, it, that particular head lent itself to that technology and it, it, it did work lovely, you know, yeah. Amazing, amazing. And what about you, Josh? Anything that springs to mind? Um, I like, uh, well, I, I like doing K2 actually. Um, so I did, um, um, so I did, it was really nice to um, work with Alan Chidick, a uh, really nice bloke and um, very funny, just lovely, lovely bloke really. And, um, and I had to go over to America uh, for the weekend to do a fitting with him. And it didn't really go very well. And it was, I made I had to do these hands and I had to do these stilts. And the, we, um, I was going to meet him in a ski shop um, to get him the ski boots. Right? With the, the ski shop guy was stoned. He was hammered. And uh, <laughs> it was really embarrassing. So, um, and, then, and then a few weeks, like a couple of months later, I sort of came on set with uh, the hands that I'd made um, and totally had to rethink how to do them, did them all electrically and the stilts that I'd made. And then Alan was like, oh, dude, this is really good. You know, it worked really well. And, um, and I'm proud of those stilts because anybody, anybody can walk in stilts that I, I made. Um, yeah. So and I, I really enjoyed that job. Yeah, Alan took to the stilts well, didn't he? He was, he was really good on the stilts. Yeah, yeah, it was like running in them, and you know, you could you can stand on one leg in them and everything. Yeah, and yeah. so yeah, it was good. That. And if I remember rightly, whenever he was on set, you were on set taking care of him. Is that right? And dressing him and making yeah, sure the stilts were functioning well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just you know, um, look after him, and, and it's it's hard, to, especially with the hands as well. It's hard to, you know, you've got no fingers to do your laces up. So um, so I'd, I'd get him into the stilts and just keep an eye on him. That was nice, it was a nice job that. Good stuff, good stuff, fond memories, fond memories. So we're getting into the end actually, guys. So really just to finish off, you know, we're, we're at a stage now where we're near the end of the production or end of the production. What what have you got planned for the future? Is there any projects that you've got going on that you can tell us about or anything planned? Like maybe just a simple holiday maybe, but uh, you know, what's going lots, on? I've got lots of holidays planned. <laughs> Good man. Uh, yeah, no, I have got, I've, I've, did, I've started another crazy um, uh, adventure business, which is um, uh, jetpack related. Um, so I'm currently in the process of, uh, I set up a company with a, with a business partner and are de we are developing um, a air mobility system, AKA <laughs> jetpack. Wow. Yeah, so uh, that's keeping me busy. But other than that, I'll be uh, traveling and yeah, enjoying some time off. I probably won't do another film or production until next year sometime. I right. think that's the way cool. I'm planning it. But brilliant. Well, good luck with the project, Matt. I'm I'm yeah. sure it'll go well. And, and I'll uh, be doing more of that as well. I've got a couple of events to do with giant Lego and 3D printing and YouTube and all that stuff keeps me busy too. Brilliant. I saw you at TCT, which is coming up, aren't you? You're, yes. Which will, yeah, I'll so be, yeah. guys, mm -hmm. pop along to the TCT show in Birmingham. Matt will be there with James Bruton. Is that correct? Yep, and I think yep. even Sam's going to be there one day as well. I think nice. I'm going two now. I'm going, I'm going two. two. I did an interview yesterday with um, Dan over at Slice Engineering, and uh, we're definitely going to go and hit some beers. I think after nice. uh, off of the show. So yeah, I'll, I'll be, be I'll, I'll be there as well. So um, cool. yeah, I'm sure we'll catch up. Cool. Right. And what about you, Josh? Anything? Anything to share? Any projects or? <laughs> I like doing underwater stuff as well. So I've got a little under, I've got to make an underwater animatronic because um, that adds another uh, layer of um, difficulty, which it just makes it interesting. So um, it's got to go quite deep as well. So yeah. I'm going to do that and yeah, you know, cool. keep, keep myself busy. Good stuff. Love it. Good stuff. Anything else, Sam? Anything we've missed? Yeah, there is. Uh, I just want to say congratu congratulations to you, Lee, on Bradford FC getting into the Premier League um, against Arsenal 2 0, I think it was. I, Brent, I it Brentford, Sam. Brentford. Oh, oh, Brentford. Is it? oh, okay. oh right. yeah. Um, that's the one. That's the one I meant. The bees, isn't it? The bees, of course. Yeah, well done. And, you know, it's funny because I was looking on the news and I was thinking, any second now, Mr. R2D2 is going to come up here. No, no. Everyone else, it would seem, 
but not you, mate. We, we, well, you were there, though. I've had them on the phone and I've assured them I'm not going to be rolling R2-D2 out on the pitch. I have been asked. Oh, really? And, and it's not going to happen. They're not going yeah. to have R2-D2. I like my job too much. I'm yeah. not going to start promoting Brentford FC with an R2-D2 in a Brentford shirt. It's not going when, to happen. When did you become the face of Brentford Football Club? <laughs> How? No, I'm avoiding that, Sam. I'm, I, well, I'm, I'm one of the uh, celebrity fans, apparently. Oh, well. That's how that's how long they've had to go. The of that barrel. <laughs> <laughs> that's how they've had to go. Zedlist, I tell you. <laughs> amazing. That's amazing. But it, but it might get me in the director's box. So maybe, yeah. you know, we'll uh, see. Uh, yeah. Maybe you'll get an invite and then you won't be so, you know. Were you, uh, I don't know how you how you managed to wangle that, but you did you sort of sidle up one day and was all like, um, do you like Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> and just slowly start. <laughs> Uh, I do quite like Star Wars. Oh, well, you might like to know. <laughs> Would you like my autograph? Yeah, I like that director's box. <laughs> I'll tell you how it happened, because it won't take long. I was coming back from LA after doing the Rise of Skywalker premiere with you guys, and I took an overhead shot of the old football stadium and the new football stadium in one shot, and I tweeted it, and I tagged Brentford Football Club coming home from Rise of Skywalker shameless i know premier and <laughs> they picked me up from that so that that's how well, it happened so kind of kind of you like yeah. you're kind Star of right, you're kind <laughs> of right <laughs> we've playing. really gone off tangent here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well hey listen guys thank you so much for uh, coming on and we finally managed to make this uh, uh, an event uh, you know, for you guys to come on. I know we've been trying for months and months and months to try and get this kind of off the ground. So thank you for uh, sparing a few moments of your time to uh, to talk to us tonight. Amazing. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I'd like to say thank you, Sam, for the lack of Andor questions. Amazing. Yeah. Escape well, while you can, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take care. Thank yeah, you, Josh. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Bye. See you, See you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.